Dale Pritchard sat up in bed and thought about what had just happened. She looked at the man lying next to her and smiled. They had been dating for two months, and in those two months she had learned that Will Conti was more intelligent and talented than any man she had ever dated. Tonight she found out that he also has an amazing manhood and knows how to use it. Dyla wondered how many times she had climaxed. She lost count after the first hour. Dela met Will a little over two months ago at her usual get-together. She and a few ladies from work were blowing off steam on a Friday night at Murphy's Tavern. Dela needed a couple of drinks. It's been a busy week at work, and the guy she's been dating for the last year didn't show up today or answer his calls. It didn't help that George was a colleague, in fact, he was her immediate superior, and it certainly didn't help that she suspected that George wasn't the kind of man to be faithful. From across the bar, Will noticed that the gorgeous blonde wasn't with the same guy he'd seen her with the previous nights. He didn't think they were exclusive because she didn't have a ring on her finger, and he saw the same guy at the club last week with another woman. Will wasn't the type of guy to flirt with another woman, but given the circumstances, this seemed like the perfect opportunity to introduce himself. Will asked the bartender to serve drinks to the four ladies at the blonde's table. When the drinks arrived... Will came over to say hello. Much to Will's surprise, the blonde was just as beautiful up close as she was from across the room. Even better, she had a friendly, charming manner. It was obvious to everyone at the table why Will was there, but he bought them all a drink and was smart enough to spend as much time talking to each lady as he did with the target of his pursuit, so the ladies let him pass and let him stay. Will did not overstay his welcome, but before leaving, he took Dela's phone number, hoping that it was really her number. Some women tend to give a fake number to get rid of the unwanted Romeo. As soon as Will left the tavern, all three ladies began giving advice to Dale. They were unanimous that Dela would be a fool not to agree to a date if Will called. Phoebe was the most adamant and, as usual, the funniest. Girl, if you don't say yes when he calls, just let me know. I've never dated a white guy before, but I'd make an exception for this one. The other ladies laughed because they knew Phoebe better than she did. Phoebe was known for her undying love and affection for her husband, Jeffrey. Will did call later that week, and Dela accepted his invitation to their first date the following Saturday afternoon. Will took Dale to the Art Institute. Dela had not. Been there for at least five years, and never with a man who had a deep knowledge of both classical and modern art. It's not like Will was trying to impress Dela with his knowledge. It was more like a conversation, finding out her likes and dislikes. By the time Will dropped Dela off at her apartment later that day, they had plans for their next date at Wrigley Field. During the game, Will admitted his ignorance of baseball and it was Dela's turn to enlighten him on the nuances of the game. It was Will's most enjoyable baseball game since his father took him to Wrigley Field when he was ten years old, shortly before his father's untimely death in an industrial accident. As the weeks passed, Dela spent more and more of her free time with Will, and much less with George. After the fourth week, Dale spent her last night in George's bed. No announcement was made. Dale simply stopped dating George, and George was too busy with other women he was dating to notice, at least for a while. Will knew that Dela was still seeing someone during those first few weeks. The relationship was in its infancy, and there were no expectations of exclusivity. But after the fourth week, Will noticed that Dela was available any time he asked her out. Neither Will nor Dale talked much about their past lovers during the first few weeks. Everyone had their reasons for avoiding the topic a sign of the times. Both were dating and sleeping with colleagues. Will had just recently broken up with Amanda Potter, one of the IT people in the office. During the first two months of their courtship, Dale discovered that Will's knowledge of art was only the tip of the iceberg. Will had an extensive CD collection including classical, country, rock, and jazz. One afternoon, they were listening to a concert in Grant Park, Will was the only man she knew who could spend the morning reading Dostoevsky and the afternoon fixing all the renovation problems in her apartment that the manager never had time for. He even spent one Sunday with her father, getting his vintage Triumph TR4 tuned up and running. 
The phone call she received from her parents that evening made it clear that both her mom and dad thought Will was the right guy. She was thinking the same thing, but wondered why Will didn't try to sleep with her. She silently worried that this might be Will's flaw. Was he a sexual? Had a physical deformity? Or inability to have sex? Or maybe was just embarrassed by the size of his tool? Deila was determined to find out, but she didn't get the chance because the following Friday, Will asked Dela to wear something cute and took her to Le Colonial on Rush instead of their usual Friday night at one of the local taverns. As soon as the waiter left with their drink orders, Will got straight to the point. You probably think I'm gay or something since I didn't try to get you into bed, right? Dela was tempted to tell a white lie, but something inside her knew that this was not the right way to begin the next phase of their relationship. She answered him honestly. Yes, such a thought occurred to me. These are some other reasons, including maybe you don't find me attractive or sexy. Nothing could be further from the truth. You are, without a doubt, the most attractive woman I have ever dated. Dela smiled in response to the compliment. Okay, agreed, thank you. But does that mean we're going back to being gay? Dyla said this to make sure he understood that she was trying to keep the conversation casual, but secretly she had her fingers crossed. No, I'm not gay, as Will said. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and I hope we can correct any other misconceptions about how attracted I am to you and whether I have problems. With performance. This thought has probably crossed your mind too, right? Dela answered his question with another smile. She was caught and she didn't need to say a word to confirm that this was one of her fears, too. Around this time, the waiter brought their drinks. They asked if they could be alone for a few more minutes before ordering dinner. Once the waiter agreed and left, Will continued. Dale, I waited so long for several reasons. One, because I knew you had a relationship with your boss. We haven't talked about it, but I have a feeling this relationship is over. Secondly, I fell deeply in love with you. It's only been a couple of months, but I'm in love with you and I hope you feel the same. And the last reason, I want our first time to be lovemaking, not just sex. And before we make love for the first time, I want us to be exclusive. No more dating, kissing, sex, whatever, with any other people. I promise not to do anything to anyone else that I wouldn't do if you were in the room with me and I would like you to agree to respect me in the same way. Will, I feel the same way. Yes, I love you. Yes, I want to take this relationship to a new level. I think you might be the man I want to spend my life with and start a family with, but we need more time together before making such a lifelong commitment. I'm looking forward to spending time with you to make sure. Finally, you're right. George and I ended our relationship over a month ago, but I was negligent and didn't tell him officially. But I will do it. And very soon. With that settled, Will resisted the temptation to skip dinner and head straight to his house. They really skipped dessert. Soon after the front door closed, both were naked, pausing their kisses only to remove each item of clothing, and again as Will stepped back to admire Dela's extraordinarily beautiful body. Will took her hand and led her to the bedroom where they made love for the first time. After those first few hours, Dela had hoped that this was the man she would love for the rest of her life, but now she was faced with a dilemma. Dela enthusiastically agreed with Will that their relationship would be exceptional. He explained it very clearly and unpretentiously. If they were close, there could be no other people in their lives, no dates and certainly no other sexual partners. Dela had a crush on Will and was thrilled that Will felt the same way. Dilemma? Dela had been dating her boss at the bank for the past year, and as her relationship with Will become more serious, Dela avoided George Tinker. George eventually noticed and started pressuring Dela about the fact that they hadn't had sex for the past month. On Monday, Dela would tell George that it was all over, and that would make the situation at work very awkward. It sounded so simple in the restaurant. Dela fell asleep in Will's arms, praying that everything would work out. Of course, this didn't happen. When those words left Dela's lips Monday morning in George's office, she saw the anger in his eyes. 
George was a proud man. Women didn't leave him, he left women. The only thing that stopped George from losing his temper and yelling at the little bitch was that he knew there were five employees on the other side of the closed office door who would hear him scream. Talk about losing face. George did the only thing his selfish mind could think of. He told Dela that it didn't matter to him because he slept with older woman the entire year they were dating and that she was a Lucy slut. Dela left the office, wondering what had made her spend an entire year with this pitiful semblance of a man. Will and Dela continued to fall more and more in love with each other and continued to spend most week nights and weekends pleasing each other. One night after great sex, Dela couldn't take it anymore. She leaned on her side, supporting her head with one hand. Tell me how you became such an incredible lover. Will laughed until he saw the look in her eyes. By now he knew Dela well enough to know that it was a serious question, and part of her was afraid of the answer. Will stopped himself from taking her question lightly. First tell me why you want to know this. I'm almost afraid of the answer. In your past, there were either many women or some kind of femme fatale. Either way, I feel like I'm competing against a stacked deck. Now Will had to try even harder not to laugh. Dale, you have no competitors. I'm trying not to laugh because I had similar questions about your past. I can't help but wonder where you learned some of the things you do with your body. Has some exotic lover taught you the Kama Sutra in the past? Please tell me it wasn't, George. God, no. I don't want to go into detail, but please believe me when I tell you that George couldn't please any of those inflatable dolls. I think you're changing the subject. How do you know how to make love the way you do? The full moon shone through the window and illuminated Dela's beautiful blue eyes. Her blonde hair practically glowed. This was the moment of truth in their relationship, and Will was determined to pass this test. No secrets. I was very lucky. In my last year at university, I became the lover of one of my college professors. We weren't in love, but we liked each other passionately. She was very vocal when it came to telling me how to please her. The affair continued throughout my senior year of school, and she ended it the day after graduation. She gave me a round-trip ticket to Europe, Europass train ticket, and Lonely Planet Guide. She told me to have a good time and forget about us. She knew that I had feelings for her, that she had no intention of reciprocating. I spent five weeks in Europe. I was moping for the first two weeks because I missed her while touring Paris, the city of love. Next two weeks with a group of Australians in the south of France and north of Italy. I spent the last week in Ibiza with an Italian colleague. I returned to the States with a deep appreciation for the knowledge my professor shared. Please thank your professor for me if you have the opportunity, but remember our agreement. We are exclusive. No memories of old times. When did you lose your virginity? Will couldn't believe this woman. Complete cliche. It was with a girl I dated in high school after our prom. I was a virgin. She said she did too. But I have my doubts. Ultimately, it didn't matter because I managed to lose my virginity before I graduated high school. That's what mattered at the time. Was losing your virginity your school goal? Yes, and this was not my first attempt. When I was younger, John Mayer and I worked as busboys at a deli, and we both decided we didn't want to graduate from high school as virgins, but neither of us had any prospects, so we decided to go to a brothel and ask prostitutes to do it. Business. The problem was that we had no idea where the house of ill repute was, so we asked the guy who was washing the dishes. He gave us an address near Comiskey Park on the south side. John and I got to 47th Street, and before we got off the train, five or six guys started chasing us down the street. It was quite obvious that we had no place on their territory. John and I were scared to death, but we ran into the tavern right in front of these guys. You should have seen the look on the people's faces in that tavern. When two white kids burst in screaming, help us, I will never forget this moment in my life. Anyway, we were lucky because instead of throwing us back onto the street, the bartender called the cops, and the cops put us on a train heading back north, where we belonged. What did you tell the cops? Did you tell them why you were there? Hell no. We told them we had read the sock schedule wrong, that we were going to a baseball game and got off at the wrong station. This entire episode changed my mind about paying for sex.
and I remained a virgin until the night of the prom. I've never paid for sex in my life. Well, at least not directly. The next time they were together, it was Will's turn. What about you, Miss Pritchard? Tell me how you lost your virginity and the kinky sex you experienced. Dale laughed out loud. You'll think you're dating the biggest prude in Chicago. I've had sex with four men in my life. Dela laughed again when she saw the look on Will's face. The first man, a real boy, was a basketball player whom I dated for two years at the university. That's right. I was a 20-year-old sophomore when Jason Jerry took my cherry. We had been dating for almost six months when it happened after a night of drinking cheap wine. He didn't take advantage of me. The wine relaxed me so much that I finally seduced him. He was always a gentleman and never even thought about hurting me. I probably would have married Jason, but he died of a congenital heart defect. No one could understand how a college athlete could have a heart condition. He was in such great shape, always running, always active. Will saw tears welling up in Dela's eyes and squeezed her shoulders. Sorry, I asked. You don't have to say anything more if you don't want to. No, I'll be fine. I admit that it still hurts when I think about Jason. He was such a good guy, and I really loved him. Dela reached over to the nightstand and grabbed a napkin. She wiped her eyes and blew her nose in the most unladylike manner. Dela got out of bed and walked naked into the bathroom threw a napkin into the toilet, flushed the water, and returned to bed. Will watched her almost perfect figure all this time. Okay, number two. This must be Jason's teammate, Tommy Rawlings. Almost a year after Jason's death, Tommy and I started dating. Jason's teammates were always kind to me, before and especially after Jason's death. Neither of them did anything inappropriate, but gradually Tommy and I felt mutual attraction and began dating without others in our group of friends. A month later, I found myself in Tommy's bed. Will knew who Tommy Rawlings was. Rawlings spent two years in the NBA before enduring his knee. He was two meters tall and black as coal. Will had a hard time hiding the fear he felt. Dale noticed this and smiled. Oh, I know what you're thinking. My friends say that you men are all the same. Of course, women are not much different. I can't tell you how many of my friends wanted to know what it was like to be with Tommy. Everyone assumes that it is as big there as anywhere else. Poor Tommy. The black man's size myth is just that, a myth, if Tommy is any indication. Let's just say that Tommy is very average in this regard. Enough about that, Will replied, quietly sighing with relief. What happened between you two? His mother. She was kind of a fanatic. I didn't want Tommy to date some white girl, especially after he signed his professional contract. She thought I was going to steal his money, which was a real joke because she was the one who bled him dry when he only lasted a couple of years in the NBA. You could see her in the stands wearing tons of bling and screaming at the judges the few times he actually got to play. Sorry again. So I guess that leaves George. Yes, George. What a mistake that was. A few months after my promotion to senior cashier, George began courting me. This was not harassment. I was a voluntary participant in this novel. He came from a wealthy family and truly had first-class charm. I was 25 years old. I haven't been in a serious relationship and haven't slept with anyone in two years. I'm ripe to choose. You once asked me where I learned to squeeze you the way I do. You can blame Phoebe. You met her that first night in the tavern, a gorgeous black lady. When I complained to her about not knowing when George was inside me, Phoebe said I should practice Kegel exercises. She said it was a cure for boys with small manhood. I think you enjoy all my exercises. Thank God it's over. This guy's ego is so big that his head can barely fit on his shoulders. He couldn't wait to tell me about all his other women when I told him it was over between us. This will definitely impact my future at the bank and I can see that I will need to start looking elsewhere if I am going to build a career. The concerns Dela expressed that day soon became more apparent. Dyla was passed over when the next manager vacancy was filled. The person promoted had minor qualifications, but no education or Dela qualifications. As difficult as her work life became, 
Dela's personal life was the exact opposite. They may have had a few minor differences, but they were all trivial compared to the similarities in Will and Dela's values, hopes, and dreams. Gradually, they became each other's best friends. Friends and family said they were soulmates, and neither of them could agree more. One real test of their friendship came in the spring. Dela convinced Will to join her JV softball team. Last fall, Dela watched Will play quarterback for his flag football team. He could throw a soccer ball more than 50 meters. Then over the winter, she watched him shoot a three-pointer in a YMCA basketball league. How could a guy who is so good at football and basketball be such a klutz at baseball? The team eventually moved Will to right field and had him bat in the ninth while Dela pitched and batted clean. Dela was amazed to see how Will came to terms with this and accepted his role with dignity. Will wasn't completely devoid of ego. The night he struck three times, he took Dale to his house and made damn sure he fucked her so hard she could barely walk the next day. Sometimes a man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. During the next game, Dyla secretly crossed her fingers every time Will took the bat, wishing for more strikeouts. On their first anniversary, Will proposed and Dela accepted. The wedding was planned for December, just six months away. The proposal wasn't much of a surprise, but Will's next statement was, I was offered a promotion. This requires me to move to the Milwaukee office. It's a small increase, but it's a step forward. I told them I'll talk to you first. I will only accept the offer if you agree. Dela was delighted with this news. Accept the promotion? It's time for me to get my ass off the ground and find another job. I will contact a headhunter in Milwaukee and begin my job search. Hopefully I'll have something before the wedding. She did find a job in Milwaukee, working for a local startup, First Business Bank. It was extra income that was comparable to what she made in Chicago, which was good because the cost of living was a little lower in Wisconsin. Dela immediately moved into Will's apartment since the wedding was only three months away. The wedding was fantastic. Will couldn't help but smile widely when he saw his bride walking down the aisle in a white dress. She looked like something out of Bride magazine, only she was real, and she was going to be his wife in ten minutes. When Mr. Pritchard put Dela's hand in Will's, looked into his eyes and said, Take good care of my little girl. Will answered with all sincerity, I intend to do it. Three years later, Dyla was an assistant manager and pregnant with their first child. Dyla took three months off when Billy, William Jr., was born. The owners of the bank, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, were wonderful people to work with. Dyla's employees got the job done and made customers happy, while the Johnsons went above and beyond to create a family-friendly work environment. Immediately after Billy was born, Will and Dale sold their apartment and bought a house. Life was good, but soon it stopped being so. Dela couldn't believe her ears. Mr. Johnson called a staff meeting and announced that the bank had been sold to a large national bank headquartered in North Carolina. It was 2009, and the economy was going to hell. Small banks across the country were closing their doors or being taken over by larger banks. It was no surprise that First Business Bank was being sold, but an even bigger surprise was that the man standing at the front of the room was introduced as the new executive vice president in charge of all retail banking operations in Wisconsin for the acquiring bank, George Tinker. Will returned home that evening and immediately knew something was wrong with his wife. He washed the dishes and kissed their six-month-old son before sitting down to dinner. He waited. She couldn't be pregnant because there was a glass of wine in front of Dela. And Dela never touched alcohol when she was pregnant. They ate in silence for no more than three or four minutes before Dela said these words. We need to talk. Can these three words be followed by good news when spoken by a loving wife? Dela continued to update Will with news about her new boss. Although Dela and George would not work in the same building, the reporting structure was such that they would likely spend hours together in meetings, either in the presence of other branch managers and assistant managers, or worse, one-on-one, -on -one, discussing its work or the work of its personnel and affiliates. Despite the nature of the topic, the conversation did not flare up. 
Both Dela and Will remained calm and discussed their options, which they realized after much discussion were very limited. They had just bought their home, increasing their budget to buy a home close to good schools and large enough for two more children. The house lost value within the first year of their purchase, as did many houses at that time. They bought the property near the peak of the housing bubble, and now their mortgage has been turned upside down. They were luckier than most. The house had only lost 25% of its value, but even after their 20% down payment, they still owed more than they could currently sell for the house. So moving was not an option. Will suggested the following option. How about a new job for Dela? Probably unrealistic, given the current financial crisis and the number of bank failures. Too many bankers are out of work looking for new positions. The likelihood of Dela getting any open positions was minimal, especially at her current salary. They're stuck. That night, Will went to bed and held his wife as tightly as he could, waiting for her to fall asleep. But it would take a while. Will couldn't shake the feeling that he had let his family down. They were unable to survive on his salary alone. In the near future, his wife will have to work for her ex-lover. Will wondered if he was man enough and, more importantly, confident enough to not let this fact affect him and his marriage. For the first three months, it seemed that all their fears were unfounded. George's interactions with Dela were professional. He didn't say a word about their previous relationship or how it ended, but all good things come to an end. One day, George invited Dale to have lunch with him, which was not unusual. A typical business lunch between an employee and a manager. At least, that's how it all started. Over dessert and coffee, George changed the subject. You know, I couldn't come to terms with the fact that you left me, especially for some poor dago. Dela was surprised by George's comment. It sounded like a bolt from the blue, and it felt like a blow between the eyes. George, what are you talking about? First of all, I don't like you calling my husband Dago or any other nasty word. Secondly, you said to yourself that you had sex with other women the entire time we were dating. Given your lack of commitment, our relationship lasted longer than it should have. George lowered his voice. Listen, little bitch. Get used to the fact that you will lie in my bed and ask me to fuck you. If not, then photos in which you are naked and are you studying the sex I have will be seen by your idiot husband and many others. And if you don't put much effort into our sex, your future job grads will suffer. Dela couldn't believe her ears. The room began to spin and her breath caught in her throat. This was the first time she heard about the photographs. Before George could finish his demands, Dela stood up and headed to the restroom where she lost her lunch. Tears streamed down her cheeks. She went to the sink to wash her face and rinse her mouth. By the time she returned to the table, George was gone. Her cell phone rang, and without looking at the number, she answered the call. I thought you would be more pleased by the prospect of our reacquaintance. Doesn't matter. You have until the end of the week to make a decision, and you better make the right decision. Dela did not return to the station that day. She went home and spent the next few hours sitting in the living room, trying to figure out how her world, like their mortgage, had been turned upside down so quickly and what she could do to get things back to normal. She usually picked up their son Billy from daycare on the way home, but today she called Will at work and asked if he could pick him up, citing the need to rest. Dale still hadn't made a decision when Will and Billy returned home. It had been a long evening, but right after Will put their son to bed, he joined Dela at the kitchen table. Will listened as Dale told him about George's demands and threats. Will didn't interrupt, but Dale knew he was fuming. She saw his fists clench tighter and saw the pained expression on his face. What she couldn't see was Will's thoughts as he listened. Will thought about murder. His only reluctance was the realization that killing George Tinker would destroy his family and he would never see his son grow up. When she finished, Will spoke for the first time. I'm going to cross the street and talk to Ron Wallace. Try to stay calm until I get back. Maybe Ron has some ideas on how we can handle this without sending me to jail. Sometimes men can just be stupid. The last sentence had the opposite effect on Dela. 
The thought of prison hadn't even crossed his mind until those words left Will's lips. When he walked out the front door, Dela cried for the tenth time that day. Ron Wallace was a detective in the county sheriff's office. Ron and Will had been friends since the Contis moved to the area. Ron and his wife Sally were the first to greet them almost a year ago. Their daughter was Billy's nanny. Will knocked on the door, and Sally Wallace greeted him with a hug. Will apologized for barging in like that and asked if Ron was home, just as Ron walked into the room and asked if Will wanted a beer. Will refused and got straight to the point. Before he finished the story, Sally said, Poor thing, ran out the door and ran down the street in the direction of the Conti house. After listening to Will, Ron asked a few questions and said that he was thinking about how best to handle the situation, but first he wanted to talk to Dela. The two men headed to Will's, where they found Dale and Sally talking in the living room. Sally reassured Dela by promising her that Ron wouldn't let Will do anything stupid and that he would have some good ideas on how to help Dyla deal with her boss. The next morning, Dyla went to work and tried her best to act normal, as Ron had advised. Ron and Will headed to the DA's office, where Ron introduced Will to the DA. Donna Carson was a large woman, probably just over 180 centimeters, and weighed at least 90 kilograms. She noticed Will looking at her and started laughing. Isn't this what you expected, Mr. Conti? Will was immediately embarrassed. Don't worry, Mr. Conti. I'm used to people being surprised. Every damn cop show on TV has some skinny prosecutor. People expect to see Angie Harmon, all 50 pounds of her, when they come into my office. Instead, they get Miss Amazon. Her manner endeared him to her, and Will smiled broadly at her as they shook hands. Now, Ron... Tell me what brings you to my office this morning. Ron took out his notebook and relayed all the information he had received from Dela. He also told Miss Carson why Dale had not met her that morning. Good idea, Ron. I will meet Miss Conti at their home this evening. Are you sure she'll do whatever it takes to get Mr. Tinker recorded? She'll be scared. But I've seen you do things like this before. I know you will prepare her. Besides, I've known Miss Conti for a year now. My wife and I think she is a strong woman and she will be okay. Ron looked at Will. As you can imagine, many women who are victims of harassment deny responsibility before we can even get a conviction, either while we are trying to force them to wear wires or in court. Ms. Carson is one of the best at helping these women overcome their fears. Mr. Conti, I'll be at your house at seven if you and Miss Conti don't mind. I will discuss our plan of action with you and your wife. Ron, can you come? If Ms. Conti agrees, we will ask her to try to tape Mr. Tinker. This will assist our prosecution and any subsequent lawsuits she may file against Mr. Tinker and the bank. Do you have a personal representative? I admit that we haven't even discussed this. I didn't think about helping my wife get rid of this jerk in her life. Ron, tell Mr. Conti the name of the most vicious shark in the water. I think you know who I'm talking about. Donna Carson spoke these words to Ron as she wrote the initials TJ in a notepad lying on the table. Will tried his best not to smile as Ms. Carson took a page from her notebook and placed it in the shredder behind her chair. That same day, Will and Dela were able to arrange a meeting with Thomas Johansson in the late afternoon. Johansson was very businesslike. He asked two questions while Dela told him about the lunch conversation and then got straight to the point. I'm going to assume you're telling me the whole truth. And if you're not, tell me now. Dela simply nodded in response. Fine. This is what I suggest. We're going to sue both Tinker and the bank. Once Tinker is arrested, and I have no doubt that is what the DA is committed to, we will freeze Tinker's assets so he can't dissipate them. His legal fees are going to skyrocket, and we want to stop him from spending it all. Will was suddenly worried about where this would lead. Mr. Johansson, we don't have a lot of available funds. You're talking about two lawsuits. Sounds like a lot of money. Especially if the bank fights it. What if we lose? Three things. First of all, it won't cost you anything if you agree to my fee of 40% of what you win— but I cover all expenses in exchange for that high. Percentage. 
If the judge or jury awards you two million, but you only get one million, I'll get 400,000. Secondly, you have a sure bet against Tinker. The only question is how much you will get. For all we know, he may have a negative net worth, although I doubt it. Third, I'm counting on Tinker being a serial harasser. These guys are rarely one and done. Usually these jerks have more than one female subordinate that they either hit on or continued the relationship with. This is where my expenses will add up and I will earn my fee. My people will find out who, what, and when. Once we establish a pattern, the bank will seek to make settlements. Understand, we could go to a jury and probably get a huge cash award, but that means at least a year of testimony before we go to trial and the possibility of an appeal. Our best option is to present evidence of systematic harassment and reach an out-of-court settlement with the bank. It will be your decision when the time comes. I'll leave you two alone to discuss this. With these words, Johansson left the room. Will and Dela looked at each other for a minute before Dela spoke. What do you think? Will replied, I like him. I don't know why, but let's call it an inner feeling. That, plus he was recommended by the DA, and I know you'll like her when you meet her tonight. If Johansson is willing to let us make the final decisions, and he pays the costs, I suggest we sign him. What do you think? Let's take the documents and read them. If everything is good, I agree. Thomas Johansson smiled for the first time when Dela told him what they had discussed. Since they needed to return home to meet Miss Carson, Johansson promised that the documents would be couriered to their home that evening. Will was right. Dela liked Donna Carson and felt comfortable with the DA laying out her plans. Carson was glad the Contis had already met with a lawyer. Everything will happen quickly. If all goes according to plan, Mr. Tinker will spend the weekend in jail. I don't know, Tinker, but if at any time you feel threatened, don't hesitate to call me. This is my mobile number. It takes courage to do what you are about to do. I appreciate it because I want to get these predators off the streets, and I need your help to do it. With her plans in place, Donna Carson left the Conti home just as a courier arrived to deliver the lawyer's papers. It took them another hour to read and sign the contract. Will Will take him to Johansson's office first thing in the morning. It was a long, stressful day. Dela lay in bed, snuggled into Will's arms, her head resting on his chest. Deep down, they wanted to make love, but they didn't have the strength. Before falling asleep, Dela whispered, I love you, Mr. Conti. God, how he loved this woman. I love you too, Mrs. Conti. Dela called and agreed to meet George on Friday for lunch. Dela usually dressed modestly at work. Donna Carson advised her to dress even more conservatively today. In such cases, it was not unusual for the defense attorney to try to blame the harassment on the victim. If the case had gone to trial, Ms. Carson would have asked Dela to wear the same outfit on the day of her testimony. For the first 20 minutes of dinner, George was extremely pleasant, displaying all the charm that had attracted Dale to him all those years ago. Dela refused his offer to have a cocktail or a glass of wine, not wanting anything to cloud her mind. As it turns out, there was a good reason for her discomfort. Halfway through lunch, George leaned forward, grabbed Dela's purse, and, despite her protests, began rummaging through the contents of the purse until he pulled out a hand with a digital voice recorder hidden inside. George turned off the recorder and leaned back in his chair with an evil grin. Dela, you stupid bitch. Did you really think I was so stupid that I wouldn't check to see if I was being framed? Dela sat motionless, the fork not reaching her mouth. She didn't say anything. Now I'm going to tell you what happens next. You really pissed me off with this prank and you will pay a much higher price for your stupidity. Here is my address. He handed her a piece of paper. Make up an excuse for your shitty husband and be there at six. Don't worry about trying to dress sexy. I'll have an outfit for you when you arrive. Don't plan on getting home before midnight, so you better come up with a good excuse for your future cuckold. Dela tried not to overreact. When did this man turn into such an evil asshole? What happens if I don't show up? I told you how important my marriage is to me. 
Why would I put my family in danger for you? Because if you don't, I can guarantee you a lot of pain. I have a video of us having sex. They will eventually end up on the internet and copies will be mailed to your family, your co-workers, and especially your precious will. None of the videos are dated and anything that might identify me in them has been digitally altered to save me embarrassment. It's so convenient how little you've changed in the last five years. No one will know that the videos are not fresh. Do yourself a favor and be at this address at 6, because if you're not on your knees satisfying me by 6.30, the video will become public knowledge. Oh, and one last thing. Just because you tried to record our little meeting, I'm thinking of inviting a friend to join us. You'll like him. Dale couldn't stand it for another minute. She stood up from the table and whispered, I hope you understand this. George didn't realize that the recorder in the purse was a ruse. It was real, but Miss Carson knew there was a good chance George would find it. So the real bug was the high-tech listening device in the wire lining of Dela's bra. George paid the bill for lunch and stood up with a big smile on his face. The smile turned into a smirk as he thought about cuckolding Dela's precious husband, but then into a concerned expression as he turned to face two large men and a large woman. Both men held badges in their left hands. Mr. George Tinker, you are under arrest. While George spent the weekend in jail, Donna Carson obtained a search warrant. It took the DA's computer expert 20 minutes to open George's computer, and even less time to find the flash drives that Tinker had not password protected. Photos and videos of Dela were found, as well as those of dozens of other women. Some of the women knew about the filming, but most apparently did not. There was evidence that at least two of these women had previously been victims of George's blackmail. One of them eventually agreed to testify at Tinker's trial. From that moment on, things went downhill for George. This couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Dela's lawyer managed to freeze George's assets while the lawsuit was pending. Unfortunately for George, with his assets frozen, George's powerful law firm abandoned him, effectively abandoning him to his fate. This development of events surprised no one. The civil suit and the criminal case against George were rock solid. The DA didn't get off with a slap on the wrist. George's law firm was able to read the writing on the wall and decided that they didn't want to be on the losing end of two losing cases, especially with the prospect of fighting both pro bono. George was left with a very bad representative. Will had to stop himself from laughing at times during the civil trial. As a result, Dela received a judgment of $2 million. Of course, by the time George's assets were liquidated, and after her lawyer received his 40% share, Dela received just under a quarter of a million. However, she considered it a windfall, especially after the bank also settled out of court and she received another 300000 George was planning to leave for a long time. He received a five-year sentence with no possibility of parole until he serves at least three years. The district attorney made sure that the sentence would not be served in one of the country club prisons. Six months after George's trial, Will and Dale were relaxing in the Wallace backyard, watching Ron grill chicken and shrimp. Dela's belly was swollen and they were expecting twins in two months. Billy was swimming in the above-ground pool with the Wallace's teenage daughter and her boyfriend. No one let Will near the barbecue because of his reputation for burning everything. So Will sat at the picnic table, enjoying a laney long neck and rubbing his wife's belly. Every couple of minutes, one of the twins would kick. Will never get tired of this feeling. The screen door from the kitchen opened and Sally walked out of the house, followed by Donna Carson and the largest man Will had ever seen in person. He reminded Will of William's former bear, Fridge Perry. Donna caught Will's gaze and burst out laughing. Will Conti, may I introduce my husband, David Carson? David, this is Will Conti and his lovely wife, Dela. Will shook David's hand, expecting a monster handshake, but was glad when David simply shook his hand firmly before turning and taking Dela's hand. Later, Dela told Will that she felt as if a big man was holding a fragile bird in his tender arms. The three couples fell into a relaxed mood. A rare atmosphere reigned in the company. 
It was obvious that each couple's marriage was based on deep love and mutual respect between the partners, and yet a comfort that allowed for some good-natured banter. The light-hearted banter was interrupted for a few minutes by a discussion of Dela's case. Neither Sally nor David were privy to many details, but Sally shared one important observation. Do you want to know what made the greatest impression on me? Besides, Dela is capable of handling all of this. Will didn't doubt her for a second. This just goes to show how important trust is to a strong marriage. Soon after this, it became easier again. The children climbed out of the pool, dried themselves off, and joined the adults at the table. The food was served. As the chicken and shrimp were passed around, Will took more verbal abuse for not being manly enough to know how to grill. Dela kissed him on the cheek. It's okay, she laughed. He's man enough for me. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.